Well, hello, and welcome back to the show. This is Thingamajigs, the exciting history of mundane things. I am Ben. And I'm Danielle. And I gotta say, it was a beautiful, sunshiny day. If I... I... If I were out today, I'd been taking lots of pictures. <laughs> I interviewed for a library job today. Did you get it? Well, I don't know. Uh, the interview went well. Are you a librarian now? Probably not, but I'll update. Cool. My phone has an update, and you know what phones are good for? Taking pictures. <laughs> we take lots of pictures of our cat. We don't have kids, so... She gets a lot of pictures taken of her, which is very difficult sometimes because she's a black cat and black cats don't always photograph well. I tweeted about this. You can use Google's night site on Pixel phones to take pictures of black cats. They retweeted me. It was nice. You X'd. I, I zeded. They zeded you back. They re-zeded me. <laughs> I'm going to just keep all the segues in. We're going to talk about cameras. We are. Yeah, they're fun. So first, I'm going to clarify that we are going to talk about still image cameras in this episode. There is a lot to cover, and I think it would be best to separate cameras from video cameras. I know they're closely related, but in interest of time, we'll stick to just cameras. If at any point during the episode you're wondering, huh, I wonder how video cameras work in that aspect, just imagine it's doing the same thing very fast. So because camera obscura is a naturally occurring phenomenon, we have records dating way back. The first written account of it was in 400 BC in China by a philosopher named Matsu. What were the other 100-something million people doing at the time while China was inventing nearly literally everything? Probably dying. China had a nice little empire built up, so they had the free time. This is why China has a big ego, because they have always been the ushers of modern existence. Camera obscura is Latin for dark room, and that is because what it is is a dark space, so a room or a box with a small hole in either the wall of the room or the side of the box. And because light is freaking bonkers, it projects an inverted or upside down image of what is on the other side of the wall that the hole's in. Light do be bonk. It's a pretty good physical example of what's going on in your eyes when you look at what's around you. Do you remember in your, I think it was my health book, that showed the diagram of light entering someone's eye and it projecting an upside down image, and then your brain automatically flips it around and corrects blind spots and edits your nose out? Stuff like that. Yup. This is why I have these intrusive thoughts while driving. I start thinking about how nothing I'm looking at is real. Well, not that the physical things around me aren't real, but that what I'm seeing isn't real. It's just my brain doing the best it can with the light it's receiving. And at any time, my brain could malfunction and I no longer have an accurate picture of what's around me. I know this is an irrational fear. But in a car, I'm going really fast and it freaks me out. I say whatever makes people more scared while driving, the better. People should be more scared while driving. They get way too comfortable in there. It is the most dangerous thing that we do every day. Anyway, so Camera Obscura was used a lot in art. Leonardo da Vinci used it to cast images and trace them. It helped us learn how to capture perspective accurately, making a flat picture look more 3D, which was pretty hard. You can look at really old drawings or paintings and see how knowledge about perspective was not well known. Paintings look pretty flat or the dimensions are off and you have to be very skilled to get a painted image to look real. We take for granted how all of that has been figured out, and you can just YouTube how to draw something, and it, all the steps are laid out for you. I mean, obviously, there are extremely talented people who can draw realistic images that you can't really tell if it's a photo or a drawing, but for the most part, anyone can look up how to draw something, and as long as you follow the steps, you can draw a log that has dimension to it that makes it actually look like it's sitting on the ground at an angle. Anyway, so from here, we will enter the 1700s when Johann Heinrich Schutz discovered that he could write messages using silver nitrate. He also discovered that it was light and not heat that reacted with the silver nitrate, which was probably his biggest contribution to the overall invention of photography. The idea that it's light that creates these images and not heat was pretty big. 
He did this experiment with stencils that covered glass bottles filled with chalk and silver nitrate. I couldn't find what he wrote, just that it was text. So I guess we could just fill in the blank with something funny. Probably wrote boobs. Just a bunch of bottles that said boobs. Mm -hmm. Some boobs and butts. Pee pee poo poo. Like it's fourth grade. Revolutionary. But the effects of silver nitrate is not permanent, so the words or any image he was able to create did not last. At the clinic, we used to use silver nitrate sticks to cauterize like toenails whenever we would clip them and if we got too close to the quick. And you could always tell who had been working on nail trims because their hands would be covered in like this dark color in the afternoon. I mean, it eventually faded, obviously, but whenever you were actually doing it, it didn't show up until later in the day. It was quite fun. How interesting. Now we enter the 1800s. This is when the real birth of the camera begins. Somewhere between 1814 and 1816, Joseph Nesseforniops creates the first photograph, and the way he did this was with a light-sensitive material called betumen of Judea, or asphalt of Syria. He cast the camera obscura onto this solution. It was like a semi-solid oil. And it took like eight hours, but the image remained even after the camera obscura had been closed. So that was a big deal. When you look at the picture, because you can still find it, it's displayed in a museum and it's actually on a piece of pewter. But you'll notice that one, it's very blurry. And two, because it took so long to to take, the light shines in multiple places. So the image is being taken out of a window and it's of what looks like maybe a courtyard. It has a side of a building on one side of the picture and another side of a building on the other side, and light is hitting both sides at the same time. So light is being cast both right and left. At the time, they weren't really concerned with anything other than, we can create a permanent copy. So it didn't bother them too terribly much that the time it took to take the picture really limited what they could capture. People can't sit hours and hours for what is already going to be a really fuzzy picture. But again, just using light to create a permanent copy of an image was huge. Obviously, he was very excited about this and shares it with his friend and will-be partner, Louis Daguerre. I know him. Which was probably very good because he died in like 1833 at 68 years old. And Daguerre continues the work and eventually changes photography into what I imagine Nips had always dreamed of and just didn't live long enough to see. And only missed it by six years, which is just heartbreaking to me. In 1839, Louis Daguerre invented the daguerreotype. It's a piece of copper plated with a thin coat of silver, and it has to have a mirror finish, so it has to be perfectly polished. And that shiny copper plate gets fumed with iodine, and from there, it takes on like a yellow tint. And then that plate goes into a box where the camera obscura can project the image on the surface of the copper plate. Well, I guess first it goes into a lightproof holder that is then slid into the box. After that, you have to go to a dark room where it's then taken out and put in another box and fumed with heated mercury, and that brings out the image. It's a lot of steps. Oh, we're not even done. And also, mercury fumes sound bad. Yeah, I thought about that too. I was like, hmm, this probably wasn't good. So there's still the business of fixing the image so that more light doesn't continue to change the image. So the plate is then dipped in a salt solution that is now called hypo. Why? It's a nickname of what it's actually called. People in photography call it hypo. It's then placed in a case designed to keep air from hitting it. Ever wonder why those old picture frames were so thick? It's because it wasn't just a picture frame that they picked out to display their, their picture. It was a specific to this daguerreotype photograph to keep it from tarnishing because air is what makes silver tarnish and these old photos were made with silver and you can still find like we, we still display our pictures in those frames that are how would you describe this look picture frames that are that are hinged in the middle and they hold two pictures and you kind of curve them in so that they stand up and that's we, how I would describe it. We still display our pictures like that, even though we're not terribly concerned about air getting to them. It's like a leftover of the first ways that we've displayed them. 
I like not using picture frames. This just uh, strengthens my, my feelings. What, you just take a picture and get a push pin and put it on the wall? What I really like is those ones where you can like get it printed on the back of glass mm. and then mount that to the wall so it's just the picture and the glass. Those are pretty neat. In relation to getting your portrait painted, it was relatively inexpensive, considering paintings in 1855 ranged from 80 to $200, which in today dollars is right under three grand to right over seven grand. It's a lot of dough. It basically cost what it would cost to just buy your own camera and have endless pictures. But to get a daguerreotype, depending on how fancy the case you chose for it was, ranged from three to six dollars which is a hundred and six to 212 in today money which isn't money you want to throw around but if it was important to you it's well within the range that you could save up and have it done as a nice present to your family you have to bear in mind that they didn't already have thousands of pictures of themselves they had about zero pictures of themselves so the uh, cool factor of having a picture of the family together was way higher back then totally worth the money I would say so. It's funny to think, like, at your wedding, you wouldn't have a photographer come and take pictures of your of the whole thing. You would just have a photographer come and take a picture of you and your family or just you and your husband, depending on how you felt about that. You'd get one picture. You better make it count. Maybe, like, two or three if you were rolling in the dough. If you were raking in the bananas. He didn't patent this invention in the usual sense. He allowed the French government to acquire the rights in exchange for lifetime pensions for himself and Niepce's son. That's nice. I like that. The French government gave the process as a gift to the world. Except England. They had to pay a fee. That's great. That's like a a global level diss. I support it. Which brings us to the next leg of our story. Daguerre was not the only one working to create a camera. There was some competition. Henry Fox Talbot, an Englishman, if you can believe it. <laughs> also, Scorned by the French. <laughs> also developed a camera. In 1834, Talbot began experimenting with writing paper coated with salt and, and brushed with silver nitrate. He then would take botanical specimens and press them between the special paper and a piece of glass so that silver nitrate would darken in the areas the plant was not covering and a perfect outline of the plant would appear. Then all he had to do was brush it with a second coating of salt or a really strong salt bath and that would preserve it. Did you ever do that thing where you take a plant and put it under a piece of paper and then run a drawing utensil over it? Yes, I did go to second grade. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had a little book of all the leaves that I did in different colors of crayon. It was awesome. Yeah, I, I remember learning how to do that in school, and it, I thought it was just the coolest thing in the whole world. Especially since we didn't ha- in Louisiana, we didn't have fall colors. So you could go out and get leaves and do that with fall colors, and then you would have fun fall leaves. I forgot about that. You're welcome. After that success, he moved on to camera obscura images, where he placed small cameras with large lenses to capture pictures around his house, and he succeeded in capturing miniature negative images. I believe his wife called them mousetraps. I don't know why. One of the main things he changed during his time experimenting with this is he switched to silver iodide, which is something that Daguerre was doing. Now, this man is quite privileged. He has generational wealth. He went to Italy for his honeymoon. He has lots of hobbies and interests, and he kind of just left this one alone for a while. He decided, I'll, I'll pick this up and work on it some more later. I'm guessing something else came along and grabbed his interest at the time. I can relate. Yeah, I've, I've watched you do the exact same thing. <laughs> That is until 1839 rolls around and he gets word about the daguerreotype. So he's really in need of getting the work he's already done out into the world, and he presents his callotype to the Royal Institute. Very original name. Why did they all end in type? I don't understand. Uh, because type meant something different. If you say that that type of person, it's that image 
or characteristic of that person. Oh, okay. If, if you would have said, she's my type, they would have been saying that she encapsulated your characteristics. I think we got it. It changed the way it is now because of typewriters. Typewriter, because it would imprint an image of a letter. So calotype in images were negatives, unlike the daguerreotype, and also they were a bit blurrier. But his invention required less exposure time, and he could create mini copies of photos taken from the negatives. But his invention was never as popular as the daguerreotype. His work in negative-positive potential in photography is the standard of photography until the invention of digital. So I don't think that is anything to scoff at. He also discovered like latent images. So he realized that you didn't have to expose it for as long. You could expose it for a few minutes and then bring it into your studio and use the developer and it, the image would come out. The war between Daguerre and Talbot still rages on, depending on what side you're on as who you consider to be the inventor of photography. We see simultaneous invention all the time, and I don't have strong feelings for one over the other, so I'll just say they both invented it. Not like how I have strong feelings about Nikon and Canon. This is a Canon family. I have a Sony guilty pleasure, though. <laughs> as long as you don't bring a Nikon into this house, I don't care. I think what we should really focus on is that this created a way for people to feel closer to their family. Before this, all they had was paintings, and that as we have already established, was very expensive, which meant that only the wealthy got to know what their ancestors looked like. Or, you know, if your child moved far away, that was it. You didn't see them anymore. You very well might forget what your own child or on the other side, what your parents looked like. You didn't get to keep those precious baby pictures. You just had to do your best to remember and take them in while they were small, which memory is not accurate. You're definitely going to forget what your kids looked like whenever they were small. We see that now. People have stopped taking home videos. And I guarantee you that they're going to forget all those little things that their kids, like those little sayings that their kids used to used to say. Um, my sister-in-law was pretty good about taking home videos whenever her kids were small. And now she goes back and looks at those videos from the early 2000s and remembers, oh, I remember when... And he used to say Paschetti or whatever it was that he would say. Yeah, I find it kind of funny and sad how people still take pictures of everything, but they don't actually keep them. They kind of just fill up their phone until they drop it in the toilet and they weren't paying for iCloud. So they just lose them all anyway. We've been really good about taking home videos lately. I think it's interesting that people take videos all the time but they're really short because we take videos for other people now instead of for ourselves what is the public going to find interesting about me and not what do i want to remember about my life in this moment yeah if i still had my three hour vhs's of uh the home videos my parents took i would totally still watch them all straight through mm -hmm. the more video the better I wish we would have had more video of our wedding. We got some video, but it really, this was before we were conscious about taking home videos. So I really wish we would have taken more video with your phone of, of that day. Mm, yeah, I reckon I could have done that. We didn't know. We were young. Well, we were planning on other people recording and no one did. <laughs> they didn't think we'd make it. We got a few videos, mostly of the ceremony, which really... I don't know. I would have liked more candid video of the reception and people having fun and being casual and being right. themselves. Oh, well, we'll just have to get married again. We, to could each have other. A, we could have a divorce ceremony where we have our last dance. Yeah. Do we get married again after that? I mean, if you want to, but like eh. after this, we need to talk about what our last dance song will be. <laughs> So this changed so much for the whole world. We finally get to see what grandma looked like when she was our age, or, or not even that far back. We get to see what our parents looked like at our age. When they were still beautiful. They're still beautiful. They're just older. We get to see people we're related to for the first time that we would have never really even known without stories being passed down. 
It's super weird to me now that I have pictures of all these great grandparents and aunts and uncles that my parents didn't know and their parents only kind of knew. And yet we can see them as real people, but don't really know anything about them. Like we don't have any stories about them. We just know what they look like. And I guess usually their names. We get to see them. We get to know what their name is, but we don't usually know what their lives were like or everyday stories about them. It brings Sonder to a new level. I think it's called Chrono Sonder, where you realize people of the past had just as rich and intricate lives as you do now. Is that an established concept, or did you just make that up? No, I think Vsauce made that up. Ah. And then the only thing that exists of them anymore is this one crusty picture Mom insists on keeping hung up. It's really weird if you just sit there and look at those pictures and think about it. It's, it really messes with your mind. <laughs> And my parents don't keep thousands of pictures on each wall like yours do. It's really creepy. It's only creepy because of how old they are. So my mom has a wall that graduates in age. The first side of the wall starts out a really long time ago, and you see the pictures get newer and newer. <laughs> I don't know if there's any room in my house where I would want to be able to sit down and have a hundred people staring at me. I don't think I would want pictures of my ancestors that I didn't know up. That's a little weird. But it makes me think of Coco, that Disney movie where once you take the picture of your ancestor down and, and you don't talk about that person anymore, they don't exist in their afterlife. It makes me want to take all of the old pictures of everyone and look at them and find out their names so that they don't cease to exist. It's very sad. I don't believe any of that, but like, what if? Artists were not pleased with the invention of the camera. This one guy I'm about to quote probably didn't speak for all artists, but a lot of them were definitely upset and worried that their future, what their futures would hold. Kind of like we do now with the invention of AI. Every time anything is invented, people get upset for these reasons. So his name was Paul Delaroche, and he said, From today, painting is dead. Very short, but very powerful. And he was right. No. No one painted ever since. He didn't think about all of the ways that having a still image of someone would really increase the variety of painting or drawing that you could do. Because you take a still picture of someone in a really awkward position that maybe someone couldn't hold for hours and hours while you're drawing them, but you have a still picture of them in that position and you can draw it. So there are some more inventions that come along that refine the process, kind of combine the simplicity of Talbot's method with the sharp, focused, overall better prints, but were cumbersome to create by Daguerre's method. It involves wet plates, dry plates, gelatins, and celluloid film. The gelatin silver is actually pretty important, and if we come back and go over motion picture, we will get more into that, but we are going to skip over them for now so we can get to what I think we are all waiting for, the invention of the Kodak moment. George Eastman, in 1888, manufactured and started selling a camera called Kodak. Apparently he liked the letter K, and that's why we have Kodak. It doesn't really mean anything. He also wanted something that couldn't be mispronounced. It used a roll film of celluloid, and each camera had 100 exposures, so you could take 100 pictures. It cost $25, which is $811 in today money. Now, I decided to go ahead and figure out how much that is per picture. So it was $0.25 cents per picture, which is $8.12 today. I think for the time, that's, a, that's pretty good. I wish they had some cameras that were just a little more affordable, maybe one with only 50 pictures, but maybe 100 was the secret number that paid for the development and shipping because how this worked was you purchased a Kodak. It was a small box, the most mobile camera of the time. It could easily fit in a woman's bag if she had a big bag, which at this time I don't think they did. We talked about this in pockets. They started taking pockets from at least upper class fashions and gave them handheld pockets of a sort. What do they call it? Ridicules. I remember that because they were ridiculous. <laughs> so anyway, once you've taken your 100 pictures, you send it back to the Kodak factory in Rochester, New York for developing, and then you get your pictures back. It's very convenient. 
truly the modern age of photography. You didn't have to be a chemist. You didn't have to haul around a bunch of equipment or hire someone to come out and take just a few portraits for basically the same cost. Their slogan was, you press the button, we do the rest. This completely changed what we took photos of. I mean, we aren't taking pictures of food yet, but we are taking more candid pictures of people we love doing more everyday things. Like being naked. Yeah. Yep. As soon as cameras were invented, nudes were taken. So we, we get pictures of vacations, birthdays, Christmas. All of these events in our life are finally getting captured. I found one article saying that Kodak was used as a verb, so people would say they were Kodaking for taking pictures, like how we would say we're Googling. I thought that was interesting. It's considerably worse. (laughs) By 1900, Kodak came out with another model called the Brownie, which was even simpler and more affordable, and also had a hilarious name. Was it brown? I believe it was. Bravo. Eh, it might have been considered gray. If your brownies are gray, you probably don't want to eat them. And if your brownies are a camera, you probably don't want to eat them. I think some of them were brown. I don't think this is why they named it that, though. I don't know why they named it that, but I can't imagine it was just because of the color. My God, did Eastman make a lot of money. He became one of the richest men in the U.S., and he still has a recognizable brand 136 years later. Not too shabby. And they stayed at the top of the leaderboard with innovation. We aren't going to get into digital cameras, but Kodak was the first to create the digital camera in 1975, which wasn't very good, but they were technically the first. And that's a pretty good head start considering the first digital camera to be commercially sold wouldn't hit the market until like 1989, 1990. Now for my favorite part of this episode, the first instant camera, the Polaroid. It was released in 1948. It didn't require developing or printing in a secondary location. It was immediate. You take the picture and bam, you have the picture. You can give it to your friends to take home. When we were in New York visiting our German friends, we brought our Polaroid and took a lot of pictures and were able to send some with them because they were immediate. It was very cool. And Polaroid was popular all through the 70s and 80s. They had a lull with digital and now smartphones making sharing pictures so easy, but they had a huge resurgence in the last, I don't know, 10 years. And they are still making new models with the most recent release in 2021. That iconic white border around Polaroid pictures. And we took a bunch of pictures with our Polaroid camera of our 4th of July party. And it's funny, whenever you look, on, whenever you look at those pictures, they look old. Like it looks like that party happened a long time ago, but it was like last year. It's really weird to look at Polaroid pictures and see modern stuff. So we have this Polaroid picture and mom's holding a cell phone. It kind of messes with your brain a little bit because you expect Polaroid pictures to be old. Buying the Polaroid film for our camera is kind of expensive because I have one. What year is mine from? Isn't it from like the 80s or 70s? 85. Yeah. Mine is from 85, so finding film for it is somewhat difficult and kind of expensive, but it's totally worth it. And now they're making new versions of that one, so more people will be buying film like that. So it'll probably maybe get cheaper at some point. Nice. And now it's part of the show where Danielle brings out the fun facts. Yippee. You ready to have fun? I'm ready. Good. So in 1900, there was this publicity stunt by Chicago and Alton Railway. They wanted to photograph the Alton Limited locomotive. So they shipped this 900 pound camera and then carried it like a quarter of a mile into a field and took a picture. It was pretty neat. I mean, you can still look at the picture. Did it look good? It looked all right. It looked good. It was a train. I like trains. It was the only picture that this giant camera ever took, and this whole PR move cost them $5,000, which is like $183,000 today. It was supposedly worth it because they sent the picture to the Paris Exposition, where they won the prize for photographic excellence. Well, all right. I want to know what that prize was. Did they get a prize for that? Because if it wasn't a $180,000 prize, I guess it brought them exposure to their railway. 
It was fairly common when a family member died to have family portraits taken with that deceased person to preserve the memory. No. Yes. They, they wanted a picture of them all together, and a lot of the ones I saw were of children. Being a child in the olden times was very dangerous and difficult. If you made it out of childhood, you were golden. It's incredible how even in black and white and with most of their eyes open, you can tell immediately which person is dead. I highly encourage everyone to look this up. Nah. (laughs) I get it. Like, you didn't know that they were going to die and you wanted to remember what they looked like. So call George, get to come over with his camera and we'll all dress up. And they dressed up the body as well and usually like did their hair and... And and then they all took a picture together. There are 12 cameras just hanging out on the moon. So when we went to the moon in 1969, we brought cameras and got some of those iconic images we know today. You think I'd remember a thing like going to the moon? Well, we did. I meant we as in uh, America. What are these cameras hanging out on the moon for? What are they doing to pass the time? They wanted to take rock samples back and all the weight in spaceships is accounted for to to save fuel and whatnot. So they took the film from the cameras and kicked the cameras out to make weight for the rocks. I bet if we went back to the moon and picked up those cameras, they would be worth a lot. We need to do the math and see if they're worth enough to go back for. Would there be a profit there? How many did you say there were? Twelve. I think think it'd be worth it. You think so? Uh, Yeah. Space travel is very expensive. I mean, it's getting cheaper every day, but still, I don't, I mean, how much is someone willing to pay for a camera from the moon? In total, it costs like $10 million to launch a Starship rocket. So if you get one of those to the moon and we chip in and we chip in like a million dollars to have them retrieve those cameras for us. It's a $2 million profit. Yeah, something like that. There you go, NASA. That's our idea. We would like a cut. If you do it and don't give us any money, we will sue. So we didn't talk about this much, but you know how in old pictures, people usually aren't smiling? It's because of long exposure. You know, you wanted to be perfectly still. So holding a smile, if someone couldn't hold a smile for that long, then they would have messed up the picture. They also had these head rest things that braced up your head so that you would be still. Which, I don't know, I feel like people could have been still without that, but I wasn't, I wasn't there. I don't know. But there's this one picture of a Chinese man holding a bowl of rice, and he has a giant smile on his face. And it's really weird because pictures from the early 1900s mostly did not see people smiling like that. So there was a lot of controversy on whether this picture was real or not. And it is absolutely real. And I kind of wonder how long he had to sit there with that expression holding his bowl of rice with his chopsticks. It looks really good. He was probably dead. That's how they did it. Like I said, you can tell immediately which person is dead in those pictures. That guy was alive. He had a really good mortician. So this next fun fact is not true anymore, but at one point, the most liked picture on Instagram was a picture of a brown egg. Now, as of January 2024, it's a picture of Lionel Messi, some soccer player from the World Cup, or I guess I should say football player. Nah, this is being recorded in America. It's soccer. I know Lionel Messi. That's so weird. Why did we all decide to make a picture of an egg the most liked picture on Instagram? I recall the egg incident. Uh... Somebody wanted to have the most liked picture on Instagram, so he posted a picture of an egg and said, hey, everybody like this picture, so it's the most liked picture on Instagram, and we did. We should try that again with another weird object. Something cool, like a glockenspiel. There are about 5 billion pictures taken every day, and 95 million of those are uploaded to Instagram, and most of those are by 18 to 34-year-olds. It's a lot of pictures, especially considering there's like this unspoken rule that you can't upload more than one picture to Instagram a day. It's a lot. It's a lot of people out there, it turns out. What is believed to be the most viewed photograph in history is that classic Windows screensaver. 
It's called Bliss, but I think we would all know it better as the picture with the green hill and the really blue sky. It was taken by Charles O'Rear in 1996 in California. It's iconic. So, Beautiful photo. If you ever wondered where that green hill was from, it's from Sedona, California. It was eventually all replaced with a vineyard, and it came back. Since then, it's, it's kind of green again, but it's, it, I don't think it'll ever look like that again. It was perfect. And that is why taking pictures is so important. There's this one guy doing the longest time lapse, and it's still going on. I don't think it's going to end until 2045, but it's of the New York skyline. And he's, it's going to be a 30-year project, and he wants to be able to see the evolution, I guess, of the city. Buildings being built and taken down and sunrises and stuff like that. I think it'll be pretty interesting whenever it ends. I have a PSA. Take more home videos. Your future selves will thank you for it. And possibly your children, if you ever find someone that will have kids with you. Or if you decide to have kids. There are apps that will put little timestamps and dates on your uh, pictures and videos. It's always nice to have. Date everything. You will not remember what time frame that video or picture is from. Please write the date on it and people's names. You will be surprised how many people's names you will not remember in the next 30 years. You think you'll remember these things, but you won't. Also, maybe have a computer with a nice reliable hard drive or SSD to transfer those pictures to every once in a while so that you can keep them forever. Especially really special ones. In fact, every picture is special because you don't ever know what's going to happen in life. If you really love that painted pumpkin that you did in 2015, take a picture of it. Better yet, hold you... Hold the pumpkin, in the, and you're in the picture, and then it'll matter even more to you. There's a lot of pictures. We were going through all of my grandma's pictures, organizing them for her. And there were a lot of pictures of landscape. And people just don't care about those as much as the ones that have people in them. People is what makes pictures special. The key to keeping digital photos and videos around is redundancy. Put them on, on multiple drives if you can. Stored in separate locations in case your house burns down. Put them on a flash drive and then stick that flash drive in a fire case. That being said, not everything needs a picture in a video. No one cares about that concert you went to that one time. Two pictures. Take one picture of whatever you went to see and then take one picture of you and whoever you went with. Yeah, two pictures max. That's the rule. That's only whenever you're sharing them with other people. Again, you need to be taking these pictures and videos for yourself. No, I assure you that you will not care that you went to see a Dave Matthews cover band. I have video from the Nako concert, and I adore going back and watching those videos. It was so much fun. I have some from the Young Gravy concert, too, and oh my goodness, is he so pretty. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to care about either of those in a couple of years. I disagree. Maybe not about the... Young Gravy one, but I think I'll still really enjoy um, watching the Nako concert. There was this one guy really getting down on that violin, and oh my goodness, he's so good. Some people have film just knocking about. Maybe you should go get that developed. That could be fun. Walgreens. Walgreens does that. CVS. There's places. If you have old reel-to-reels or if you have old VHSs, there are companies that you can send all of that to and then they will digitize it and send you back copies. You should really get that done because those things are not going to last forever and finding a VHS player is really difficult. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Thingamajigs and another exciting history of a mundane thing. Don't forget to grab a goose. And bring back leaf rubbing. That was fun. What is that? Don't do that. Don't. They didn't ask for that. No, it's when you take That's a disgusting. leaf and you put your crayon over it and you make fun. Thanks for listening. Nah.